Year 10 and 11, welcome to your comparison of the poems Poppies by Jane Ware and Bayonet Charge by Ted Hughes in preparation for your AQA English Literature Poetry Exam. When comparing poems, we need to use a range of connectives. The top set of connectives in black are if the poems are different. You've got whereas, on the other hand, however, in contrast, unlike and alternatively. And if the poems are similar in any way, you might use similarly, likewise, equally, as with and in the same way. When analysing structure and language devices, again, we don't want to repeat ourselves. So here is a variation of the word shows. So use a few throughout your essay. You've got suggests, implies, outlines, highlights, describes, communicates, connotes, emphasises, reveals, displays, establishes, portrays, represents, illustrates, informs, means, conveys and symbolises. So try to use a range of those in your answer. This is the essay format that I would use. If this varies from what your teacher has taught you, then please do listen to your teacher. I would use an introduction to answer the question, analyse structure in poppies, analyse structure in bayonet charge, then language in poppies, language in bayonet charge, and then conclude. I have written an example paragraph for the introduction and an example paragraph on structure at the end of this video. Let's begin with the structure. We'll start with the structure in poppies and then we'll move to the structure in bayonet charge. So, poppies uses four irregular stanzas and this represents the mother's experience and the change in her emotions. Her emotions increase in severity as the poem progresses. She is not prepared for her son to leave. Poppies also uses free verse and that represents the freedom of the sun to explore the world independently, which links us to the simile, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. He wants to go out and experience the world and to see what it's like to experience new things. But it also signifies the flip side of that and that is that the mother feels lost without him. One, without him when he leaves to go to war and two, when he dies. Enjambement is also used as well, and that is the cycle of children leaving home and the idea that it is never-ending. Children are always going to grow up and leave home. And this is continuous and it's something that is unavoidable. And the mother, bless her, she tries desperately to cling on to the son, but ultimately and inevitably he does leave. We also have your shazera. If you don't know what that is, it is a pause in the middle of a poetic line. And your shazera is the mother trying to remain calm and composed. You know, when she's with him at the, the front door and she sorts his collar out and she gets all of the cat hairs off him. She's trying to remain calm and composed, but she breaks down especially at the end when we hear that she's a wishbone and we realise just how fragile she is. And also in poppies, we have a non-chronological order, which is used to show us that the mother keeps remembering the past and bringing up the memory of her son as a child. And when we add that to the fact that you have a mixture of the past and the present tense, we'll say that again, there's a mixture of the past and the present tense which represent the memories she has but also the idea that time has moved on, but she can't because she's trapped. She's trapped in this loving memory of her son as a child playing. Okay, we will now move to structure in bayonet charge. A bayonet charge begins in media res, and that means in the middle of. So the reader, we, are plunged into the action. And it's much like the soldier going over the top. He's thrown into the action. He runs over the top of the trench without thought. And you've got this immediate sense of urgency. And similar to Poppy's bayonet charge also uses irregular stanzas. The first and the third stanza are full of action. But the second stanza slows down the pace of the poem. 
And the second stanza slows down as the soldier thinks about his actions and the fact that he realises what is happening. So, you know, you can imagine he's ran over the top of the trench without thought. And then when we get a stanza two, he realises what's going on and it seems unreal. You've got that quotation in bewilderment then he almost stopped and you've got a hyphen there, which is your Shazura and that represents his confusion. He stops in the middle of, of the battlefield as, it, as if, to, oh my God, what's happening? You can, ima you can imagine that's what soldiers would feel. And much like poppies as well, we've got free verse. It's the lack of order in the emotional charge of the soldier, as we said earlier. It's like he doesn't give it a second thought. He runs over the top. You know, he, he puts the knife on his... Um, he puts the B in it onto his gun, apologies. And it's this lack of order. And it's, it's the chaos of war, a chaos, the chaos of a war zone. And we've got Enchantment and Shazera. Again, very similar to Poppies there. And your Enchantment and your Shazera further emphasise the contrast between the soldier's movements, i.e. running, and his thoughts and fears. And the enchantment in stanza one mimics the action of running. And we've got, as I say, we've got this fast-paced urgency. But your shazera causes a sense of confusion and conflict because it breaks up this flow. And it also gives a sense of halting breathing. Like a... <gasps> okay, so your shazera is hugely important in being at charge. I hope that's been useful before I move to language. Don't forget to pause the video and make your notes uh, if I'm talking too quickly. We're going to move to language now and then we're going to look at an example paragraph that I have written. Moving to language, Poppies. Poppies uses the first and the second person and it's the last memory of her son and the visiting the memorial. So we have a shift in time and it shows the different ways she remembers him and how she grieves and she speaks directly to him as if trying to keep his memory alive. Immediately in Poppies as well, when we hear Armistice Sunday, it sets up the tone of the poem and the image of the poppies and we immediately think of Remembrance Day, death and respect. So, so almost straight away, we have the themes of the poem and it, and it also dictates how the reader responds to a certain degree. We have this image of crimped petals and it's almost a foreshadowing this ruined poppy is almost the foreshadowing of, of what's going to happen to her son. And then we get this, the word spasms and it sounds painful and comfortable. And when we look at words like spasms and barricade, again, it's, the, it's this example of foreshadowing and doom. It's, it's the image of doom, that word spasms. It sounds painful and uncomfortable. We have the emotive language of graves and we think of all the soldiers that have been lost. The direct pronoun you, as I said, she addresses her son as if speaking to him because she refuses to let him go. And when we couple that with the personal pronoun I, we have this connection to the mother. We feel what she feels and we experience what she experiences. And as she's standing in front of her son, she removes the cat hairs from his suit. And we are told that the sellotape is bandaged. And bandaged naturally has connotations of an injury. And therefore the reader starts to think and fill in the blanks. Did her son suffer a painful death? Was he injured really badly, in, which has led to his death? And then we get the metaphor, which is a, a pretty huge metaphor, steeled the softening of my face. She's trying to be strong and brave in front of him, so she steals the softening of her face. Again, remember, inevitably she does break down, but she tries to be strong. I'm going to do all of the language devices in bayonet charge now down the right. And then on the next slide, again, we'll do poppies, then bayonet charge, just so we keep the same format. So moving to bayonet charge then, we get the pronoun he. And that keeps the soldier anonymous, and therefore he becomes a universal figure. 
Basically, it could be any soldier in World War I. So the poem focuses on one individual, but actually it represents all of the soldiers in World War I. As the poem progresses, the soldiers' movements are breaking down when he realises his actions. So the verbs change from running to lugged to plunged because he starts to lose control. We then get the metaphor, his sweat heavy. War is a burden. It's like he can't carry on. He can't even carry his own sweat. And it links back up to the word lugged. He's struggling here, isn't he? And that then links to stumbling. He's having trouble. He is having trouble fulfilling the actions of a soldier, i.e. to shoot and maybe kill someone else. The simile, the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest, has a feeling of doom about it. It has this feeling of death. And we get the word patriotic, naturally, a lot of soldiers are, but the patriotic tear. Now, obviously, tears can't be patriotic, so in that instance, we have a, a little bit of personification. Tear, naturally, is emotive language. He's upset. He's in the middle of the battlefield and he's upset about what he's facing. And look at that sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. And it's that, as I said earlier, he can't carry on. He, and actually here he can't really control his emotions. He can't control his tears. Personification, bullets smacking the belly out the air brings a sense of hell to the battlefield smacking the belly out of the air I suppose to a certain degree that is sound imagery isn't it and it's what he hears you know the boom of of the gunshots and the shells and probably the squeals of death and if we look at the word smacking uncomfortable violent sense of doom in bewilderment, then he almost stopped. And that is when we start to realise his confusion. He is conflicted between his actions as a soldier, i.e. shoot the enemy or stab the enemy, and the process of war. And remember, futility is a theme here, isn't it? That to many people, war is futile and it never solves anything. And what it leaves us with is heartache and loss. Rhetorical question, in what cold clockwork of the stars and the nation was he the hand pointing that second? And this question refers to the destinies of people and nations and the elements of clockwork. He could also be referring to the government here and the idea that it'll disappear because they don't matter anymore. So the people in charge don't really matter because, as I say, war's futile. And he wonders if he is a hand on a clock, on the clock face, helping time tick by. I suppose to some degree as well, it is insignificance. The word clockwork suggests he's a cog in a machine. And that, and that actually he's not really important. He's just helping things tick over, if you like. And also, in that stanza, words such as size and nation further emphasise his insignificance. And alliteration, I suppose, emphasises that cold clockwork. What Hughes does in the first two stanzas then is he shows us that a soldier is reacting instinctively to fire, to fire at the enemy. And dying for your country seems irrational. And therefore, he, Ted Hughes, forces us, the reader, to question patriotism and whether it is actually worth it. There's a contrast between patriotic ideas and reality. So the soldier's overriding emotion and motivation is fear. 
which has replaced anything that was patriotic. If we go back to the left-hand side, which is language in poppies, we've got two memories, him leaving home and him being a child. And we get that in the line, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. And if you look at words such as play and little, again, we are reminded of childhood innocence. The memory that she clings to is a happy memory of him as a child. And again, we have the maternal instinct of the mother, which, which goes throughout the poem. The metaphor black thorns of your hair is prickly towards her as a grown man. He's not affectionate. He's not affectionate towards her. But her words slowly melting shows that she, the mother breaks down. And we see this because her words melt. And as I said earlier when we were talking about the Shazura, she does try her best to remain calm but can't. And this then goes to the metaphor all my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt. So our words are flat, then they roll, then they turn to felt. And felt is something that is easily to manipulate and move, isn't it? It's quite soft. So trying to fight off the emotion, but can't. She is a broken woman, if you like. Emotive language is clear throughout the poem. We had graves already and now we've got brave. The mother is brave because she lets him leave home, but he is brave because he goes to a war. And he goes to war because, as the simile says, like a treasure chest, the world is overflowing like a treasure chest. He wants to experience the big wide world, if you like, the culture of other places. Experience things independently. And this idea of treasure suggests, it, suggests it's going to make him richer in terms of the person he is. And that links to in, intoxicated, which is, again, metaphorical. The fact that he's going to be intoxicated by the world because he's excited. He's excited about what he's going to witness. There's a deep irony here because, as the reader, we know, unfortunately, what happens. There's image, imagery and symbolism throughout the poem and we have an image of a songbird. She has released him. And the songbird then is almost replaced with the dove and the dove is a symbol of innocence. And that is how she remembers him, an innocent child. That's a young man that's gone off to war, taken too soon. She uses a metaphor to describe her stomach. She's anxious emotional, worried. My stomach was making tucks, darts, pleats. She feels sick at the thought of what could happen to him when he's away, when he's at war. Being at charge. We've got the simile. He was running like a man who was jumped up in the dark and runs listening between his footfalls for the reason. So we have the image of a man running without purpose. The soldier's awareness in the second stanza is that he is running like a man who has jumped in the dark, but all of the time wondering why he's running. And he listens for the reason why he's running. And using someone blind suggests there's no rational reason for war. When I said blind there, sorry, I meant blind, obviously, in the dark. Running in the dark, you're blind, you can't really see what you're doing. And then we get a sim another simile. His foot hung like statu statuary in, sorry, pronunciation and stuttering, in mid-stride. And that word, okay, the word statuary suggests he's stone, he's still. And we've got the shazera to follow that in mid-stride. And there's your pause. And I mentioned the use of the shazera earlier because it is important here. The second stanza, as I said, pauses the action because the so soldier wonders why he's there. What is he doing? And we've got a lot of enjambement in this stanza. And it creates chaos and a haphazard effect 
which represents the soldier's urgency and desperation as he stumbles forward. Ted Hughes uses a lot of sibilance here as well, and I've just put a couple of lines. When you read those lines, you have got hard, harsh consonant sounds, and it's the sounds of the bullets smacking the air, as we heard earlier, and it is the sound of dread and fear. In what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he, the hand pointing that second? You can hear the harsh consonant sounds, and as I say, that's the sound of fear, the sound of dread. We get imagery in the last stanza of the hair. And it says, Threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide open, silent, its eyes standing out. So it's a simile and it's imagery. And the scared hair, I suppose, parallels the soldiers. And we've got some alliteration of the letter C and the word threshing. And we know that threshing is a machine used for harvesting, but actually it suggests pain here. So there's some use of shocking imagery to bring home the sights and the sounds of war. And this helps to convey the confusion. The poem was written by Ted Hughes to portray soldiers being alone. And via this hair image about its open, um, its mouth wide open, silent, its eyes standing out, the soldier's dilemma is emphasised. After hesitation, he decides to fight because he's been persuaded by a kill or be killed scenario. As I said, I did mention earlier that the verbs get worse as the poem goes on and he becomes more desperate and we get the word plunged. And I suppose there's an impression of determination here. Plunged, desperate and determined to survive, isn't he really? Emotive language is visible again in King Honour and Dignity with a the theme of bravery, but it leads us into a simile. We get King, Honour, Human Dignity, etc. dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm. It's like he's been reduced to a basic level of existence. He attacks out of desperation, not out of moral principle, which is interesting to consider. And the word etc. suggests that men join up for patriotic reasons, but none of those things, king, honour or human dignity, matter when you are in the middle of a battle and this list is the list of reasons people fight king honor human dignity but actually by using the word etc hughes suggests that any other reasons are not worth listing it's not worth it again which goes back to the theme of futility is war really worth it And the last line, it, it goes, the second last line into the last line reads, to get out of the blue crackling air, his terror's touchy dynamite. Again, alliteration there in sibilance. The last line suggests that the soldier has lost control. Sorry, I've made a type and error. I've put he is going T, lose control instead of two. I apologise, type and error. He's going to lose control of his emotions which is the consistent theme throughout the poem. We've got the conflict of what he's doing and the emotions he feels. So your last stanza has a mood of terror. In the beginning, the soldier believed in patriotism and that was perhaps the reason he joined war. But in reality, he soon realises that the most important thing is staying alive and his overriding emotion and his motivation is fear. So fear replaces patriotism. Your last few instances of language in poppies, and then I'll do a more generic summing up before we look at the paragraphs I've written. The last answer of poppies we hear about a hill, and the hill is metaphorical of a struggle. 
because her son has died. And it is the struggle of, of life without him and the struggle every day. And we know that she feels grief as she traces his name in the gravestone. We then get the simile like a wishbone and, and this presents an image of her being fragile. She's broken. You can picture her looking like a wishbone as she leans up against the gravestone. Easy to break. And we get the symbolism of the dove, which represents peace and innocence. Combined with the word freely, her son is dead, but he is free of the horror of war. And then we return to the most prominent image, the image that the mother clings to, which is the, the image of him playing. She hopes that she'll hear him playing again. And we know that that hope is futile and pointless. The image of him being on the playground once again reminds us of his innocence and the maternal instincts of a mother. You know, a mother more often than not always thinks their child is innocent and tries to protect them. So summing up then of poppies, the form of the poem and the sound of the poem is restrained. As I said earlier, we've got free verse. If you use rhyme in this poem, it might sound, it might add something lively and something joyous and therefore it would be out of place. So we get free verse, which is restrained and almost to some degree represents how the mother tries to stay composed. In, ten, in stanza one, we have a lot of colour and texture, the description of the blazer, and we feel how close the mother and the son are. But this is disrupted by words such as spasms and blockade, which naturally create this sense of doom and a sense of foreshadowing. Throughout the poem, there's a contrast between death and domestic happiness because the mother tries to block out the image that her son has died and therefore she fills the description of wiping down the hairs off his blazer and attaching, attaching the poppy to his blazer and things like that. In the last stanza, our la the language becomes metaphorical and symbolic through the dove. Uh, the songbird is a metaphor for the mother setting the child free. And this changes to the dove, the symbol of peace. Here the peace the son has found is only the peace of death. A summing up then of language in being at charge. This frantic action in the battle and in the difficulty of running in the mud. And in the middle of all this, there is the sudden fear and clear thoughts of the soldier. And these feelings and thoughts are presented through images that we can see and hear. Ted Hughes uses a lot of repetition from the beginning. And he, in stanza one, repeats the letter H to express the soldier's heavy breathing. This imagery throughout, the rich descriptions contrast with where the soldier is heading, i.e. to fight. And another form of contrast in the poem is between the imagery of war and the imagery of nature. Throughout the poem, we've got a background of farming and the natural world. The hair, the image of the hair, however, becomes the image of death. Okay, I hope all of these notes have been useful. Don't forget to pause the video because there's been a lot said in making notes. And or you can look at the individual videos I've made for these poems, which are found on my YouTube channel. I'm now going to show you what an example opening might look like and what an example paragraph on structure might look like. If we imagine then that the question is on conflict, we might write something like this. The theme of conflict is presented as something personal in Jane Ware's poppies as we witness the struggle of a mother to let go of her son. To let go of him physically and allow him to go off and experience war. But to also let the memory of him go, which she naturally holds dear. However, in Bayonet Charge, Ted Hughes presents the experience of going over the top. The conflict exists between the idea of a soldier being a person and that of a soldier being a weapon of war. 
Additionally, we are also presented with the conflict the soldier faces, that of his own actions and the whole process of war. Your section on structure might read like this. Jane Ware utilises four irregular stanzas and this represents the mother's experience and the change in her emotions, which increase in severity as the poem progresses. The conflict of letting her son leave and wanting him to stay is clear throughout the poem and the maternal instincts of the mother are ever present. Moreover, Weir incorporates enjambement to symbolise the cycle of children leaving home and how it is a never-ending process. This device, coupled with the Shazera, outlines how the mother wants to halt this process but inevitably fails. Also, the Shazera displays the mother's attempts to remain calm and composed, but ultimately she breaks down. Using a non-chronological order conveys that the mother is remembering the past and this combination of the past and present tense presents a conflict between her memories and the present day. The idea that time has moved on, but the mother cannot. She is trapped. Whereas a bayonet charge begins in media rays, meaning in the middle of, the reader is plunged into the action much like a soldier thrown into action as he goes over the top, without thought, and this is the central conflict in the poem, that between his thoughts and his actions. Hughes employs irregular stanzas to emphasise the conflict, as stanzas one and three are fast-paced and full of action, unlike stanza two, which slows the poem and demonstrates the soldier's emotions. This conflict is further heightened by the combination of free verse and shazura, which underlines the confusion of the soldier and gives the, gives the sense of halted breathing, perhaps even panic. I hope this comparison has been useful. As I say, there's been a lot said, so make sure you go back and pause it and make a note of what's been said. Don't forget to check out the individual videos on my YouTube channel. Just type in Stacey Ray, S T. A C A Y and Ray is R E A Y and good luck in your poetry exam.